What's up, guys, and welcome back to Paint Bravely, the podcast where you can find a little bit of encouragement, discover new ways to make your hobby more fun, and most importantly, learn to paint bravely. Now, today we're going to talk a little bit about different kinds of hobby products, things that maybe you should be using or shouldn't be, things that you, I don't know, maybe want to invest in for the future or not. Or can't stop yourself (laughs) from buying. Yeah, exactly. But before that, before that, what have you been up to, Brent? Well, today I painted a tank. And I'm not talking like 40k tank. I'm talking like mm, uh, like a Sherman old man tank. <laughs> yeah, like some bolt like action. A... No, no, it actually is a a fantasy or a sci-fi tank. It's from Victorian ah, miniatures. Okay. But I painted it up like a historical person. Cool. You know, I had no crazy highlighting, color transitions with the airbrush. Just a flat coat of green paint, and then I got started with my weathering powders and the the oil washes and all that. So I've been having a great old time with this tank. Nice, taking a dip into the old uh, what is it? Scale modeling, yeah, yeah, sort of. This was a, a Goober Town roulette roll where. Ah. I mean, this episode will probably be out by the time this podcast episode is out, but I, I yeah. got a dwarf. And I rolled that I needed to do weathering on this dwarf. And then somehow I'm like, all right, this dwarf is going to be riding this tank and we'll weather the tank. And then that's going to be a cool project. But I actually did get a really cool way to convert uh, a turret from 40K into like a cockpit for a tank. And then a really cool way to like switch out the cockpits or, or the turret on the tank. So I've got this crazy dwarf in his own little turret cockpit (laughs) sitting on this Victoria Miniatures tank. And it's the stupidest thing, but I think it's going to be really cool. Uh, That sounds awesome. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's always good when you get stuck into a project like that and doing new stuff and weathering bravely and Mm. all that good stuff. Weathering bravely. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. We should change the name of the podcast. (laughs) So... That's uh, that's an update for me, Casey. What, it's your turn. What have you been up to? <laughs> that's not all you Just have. Just rolling here. But let's see here. I painted, I painted a dank hold trogoth. It's been sitting. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, you saw it. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Didn't didn't click away this time, <laughs> like last week. <laughs> I watch a large percentage of your videos. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> eventually. Yeah, I- I'm right there with you. <laughs> mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. yeah i uh i've had this this trogoth on my shelf for uh well whenever whatever it was december when we were barely brand new making youtube videos and the the gloom spike gets came out um i did buy it on ebay so it counts um and it's just been sitting and i don't know why it's like i was super excited when i bought it and i just saw it up there this week and i said you know what i have to paint it I don't, I don't even care. So I did. Oh, that was the old episode where you bought new stuff from eBay? Is that the one yeah. you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. New stuff at The first a time you used price. drone footage. You had drone footage of like you <laughs> going to your uh, mailbox to get your eBay <laughs> shipment. That was great. I did, yeah. <laughs> like any you excuse. Muttering to yourself about gits the whole time. <laughs> you're running out to the mailbox and you got all these new GW boxes with your dank old draw gods. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Perfect. Man, that was that was the good old days. <laughs> Seems yeah. like so long ago too. <laughs> oh man. Look, I did watch this video and I gotta say you used some awesome colors through the airbrush and I really like the way you got that started off. It's a, it's a big old trogoth and you got the, the flesh and the purples and the pinks and everything on there. Looks good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm getting a I'm getting a lot of comparisons to to Dana Howell. Everybody's like, "Oh yeah, you're you're getting on that vaporwave train." I'm like, "Not not really." Like not I didn't Yeah, you know. you're using that Dana Howell pink and purple. Is that right, what it yeah. is? It, just if you use anything on the pink and purple uh side of the color wheel. It, it kind of got me thinking like I mean, I know there are people out there with very very specific you know, that they paint this way all the time. And she's one of those kind of people, right? That it paints this this vaporwave and uses the fluorescent pink and the purples and does all this stuff. And like, yeah, looking at it, like, okay, I could see how you might think that, but those are also just the colors I had, you know? 
Um, yeah, I, w- I would not say you were uh, copying Dana on that one. No, 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 no. no and, and that thought had never crossed my mind. But that does bring up something else that kind of happened the week before where I, I like a bunch of people were telling me that I was copying uh, Marco Frazzoni from Not Just Mecca. And like, I'm seeing a pattern. I here. know, which is really, really bad for me because I'm not doing that stuff on purpose. You know, it's just like I pick a thing, I pick the colors, and I go for it. Now, in the in the case of the uh, the Marco video, like the way that I did the models was very similar, like really similar. So I get where people are coming from, but it's like. There are two ways that I could have gone about that. Like if I was actually trying to copy someone, like we've talked about before, I would have said, hey, I'm going to try and do this paint scheme and and see if I can follow their tutorial, right? I didn't do that or else I would have if if I thought that it was even close to that. I just thought it was kind of interesting. It's two weeks in a row where (laughs) these comparisons are being drawn like completely not on purpose by me. Yeah, I mean, I saw for the Unmade War Band for that video, you actually did leave a sticky apology in yeah. the comment section of that video. Like, yeah, I guess this is kind of similar to a video I watched a year ago, and well, I kind of feel bad about that. He's a better artist than I am, though. So uh... right, so <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he he yeah. did a way better job doing it than I did, and it's like right. a, a sad attempt at something, but not on purpose right. at all. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know for me, if if I see somebody else do something that I'm interested in, a lot of times that'll mean like, oh, can't do that anymore. Yeah. Like, oh, oh yeah. now I need to change my color scheme that I had in my head. Like, this is this is not going to work for me anymore because <laughs> they already did it better, you know? Yeah, exactly. And and I, I try and be pretty good about that because like, yeah. you know, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm making something every week. I got to think outside the box, got to do something that someone else isn't doing. You know, we had that whole conversation about, I don't want to paint my orcs like Guy painted his orcs. So it's like, no, you don't. I don't want to then go out of my way to then just rip somebody off. Like, why would I do that <laughs> to myself? You know? So I don't know. It was, it was an interesting uh, last week, but I'm pretty happy about the, the Trogoth, even even if people think it's vaporwave, like that's fine. Data's a good painter. <laughs> yeah, I don't think in the the similarity in this case was you used like that shade of pink and purple. Yeah, and that was about it. You yeah, know, um, I didn't get any of those comments though colors, when I painted that you know, Rodigus. Data does on all of her stuff, and she has a very distinct style. And you can look at some models and say there's a good chance that Dana painted that. But. Right. Yeah. Um, when I painted the Rodigus a few weeks ago, it, it, like if you put them side by side, it, they're essentially the same basic colors, like including the purple to fluorescent pink transition. Nobody said anything about it then. So I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if it's just, uh, it's just out there. People are aware right now. Are you just uh, getting letting the comments get to you here, Casey? Is that what it that, is? You getting a little yeah, sensitized? That might be what's going on. And and I was going to ask you specifically if you think that's just this is just in my head for the most part. Like, I'm I'm seeing these comments. Are people out to get me, or am I just being ridiculous? I'll be honest. It's been a while since I saw that Marco video, so I don't know. I don't know if you were copying or not. Hmm. Hmm. I believe you, though, Casey. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. Well, I appreciate Not it. everybody does, though, and that's what we're talking about that's here. True. Yeah, not everybody does. But, I mean, hey, new video next week. Moving on. Moving on. But still, this is an important moment. This is the closest thing you've had to an apology video. You, right. You've at least got the apology <laughs> sticky comment in there, and uh, this is a big moment yeah. for you. I mean, we talked about that a while back. It might have even been on the podcast, like, real early. Um, yeah, I think you asked when me if I had done, do an apology yeah, like, video. are we going to have to do yeah. that? And like, I almost felt like it this time, like I felt bad cause I don't want to do that to somebody, you know? Um, but a sticky comment kind of explaining my situation, I guess was about as far as I was willing to go this time. 
you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I also um also got chaos bombed. Right? Is that what it's yes, called? You did. Yeah. Yeah. Are you gonna explain what that is? Um, I mean I barely know what that is. I, I just know it happened to me. <laughs> okay. I I have to feel a little bit responsible for this chaos bomb. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But while we're on the subject of people posting comments on your videos. Yeah. There was a day when you got what, like a couple hundred comments all at once? Is it, that what it happened? It was like two seventy five or something. It was okay, a lot. So and, and it was one specific video? Yeah. The uh racks, actually. The rack video. Nice. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so normally on a YouTube video, eventually you get like a couple hundred comments over the lifespan of the video, right? Yeah. And this was a situation where you got two seventy five and like three minutes or something basically yeah like uh continual notifications on all devices just non-stop hey you got to turn that off (laughs) otherwise you just leave yourself open to being (laughs) chaos bombed it's true but yeah so a chaos bomb it's a diabolical thing invented by apparently dave over at mini wargaming and a week or two ago i was on dave's sort of podcast sort of video show yeah Anyway, he he had me on as a little bit of a guest, and we we were talking about stuff. And then as we were winding down, he says, okay, it's time to do the the chaos bomb. So this is something that they do to, you know, I guess stress people out when their phone just starts melting, or (laughs) or maybe it brings a smile to some people's faces. I don't know. But basically call out a couple of, (laughs) yeah, calling out a couple of creators, maybe smaller, maybe not, and just sending everybody who's watching that stream from mini wargaming which is a giant channel yeah so this giant stream uh you know just just sending the dogs out the chaos dogs to go <laughs> bomb you in this case yeah we actually called out a, a couple of their channels while we were at mm-hmm. it but you know dave and i were talking like ah, casey's gotta have his notifications off there's no way that his phone's gonna <laughs> send him 275 emails <laughs> well i don't have the email um, notifications but i'm glad we were on. wrong about that yeah <laughs> well it's like i was in that stream i was commenting and people were responding to the things i was saying so it's kind of funny if you you, you go back and look and it's like you're like oh I, I hope he has his notifications on and i'm literally like i do well we'll find out <laughs> but i do <laughs> <laughs> oh that's embarrassing okay right. <laughs> well that was pretty funny because because dave put me on the spot he's like okay we're gonna we're gonna chaos bomb somebody right now and that was kind of ringing a bell like i i vaguely remembered that this was a thing that they did and like oh no who and he's, he's putting me on the spot like okay who are we doing who are we going to yeah and like for a second i could not think of a single other creator on youtube like right. just just, just my mind is entirely blank, blank just <laughs> deer in the headlights yeah uh, who are we bombing? Who are we bombing? And then like a few names would come up and like, oh, that's that's too mean or, or whatever. <laughs> and it, it took me like probably like, 45 seconds to remember like, oh, yeah, I know Casey. Like this would be kind of funny. <laughs> right. like, yeah. Just messing with me. Casey exists. So I, sh- I should send the right on over there. So that was a big day for you. That's awesome. That was good stuff. Yeah. Big like day that. for me too. Yeah, for sure. It was pretty awesome uh, being on this show and everything. Yeah, so that was the first time that I got to meet Dave from Mini Wargaming, and yeah, that that was one of the first Wargaming, like, YouTube channels I happened to come across when I was getting back into the hobby five years ago now. Mm. Yeah, they had a, the video that that caught my attention that time was, we are closing the Mini Wargaming store. They posted a video seven years ago, and I was like, I interesting how the mind works you see that thumbnail like oh who are these guys and why are they closing their store like what's, right. <laughs> what's this all about and that was my that was my first introduction to him i mean it's just like you know the thumbnail of like i'm quitting youtube like ah, oh, who's this guy and why are they right. quitting youtube like, <laughs> oh, uh, hope they're being real not oh, just saying uh, that <laughs> uh, big day over here yeah you gotta wonder sometimes but yeah, the mini war gaming guys have been around for a while. They do a ton of everything, but especially mm-hmm. battle reports. They've built their own complex, 
just on the Canadian side of Niagara Falls, and they've got it's essentially like a bed and breakfast or hotel or something <laughs> that's themed after Warhammer. Hotel. Yeah. And so they've got, yeah, so they've got like several playrooms that are apparently kitted out for filming and everything. And they also have rooms for like visiting gamers to stay in. Mm -hmm. So that it's a like a tourist de destination for for wargaming. So, you know, yeah. after f folks like us are allowed in Canada again, maybe we'll go sometime. You know, I mean, I'd be down. Like, I will meet you there. I mean, you're not that far away, mm -hmm. right? Like, you're you're on the east coast. I think it's so. a, maybe a ten hour drive. Yeah, that's not. You yeah, remember? Yeah, back in middle school, maybe high school, there was like a school summer trip outing camping program that was like biking across canada mm. and it it ended at at niagara falls and then the you know loaded up the bikes and vans and and drove back home but nice. it's uh it's driving distance it's doable yeah it's pretty yeah, far away we're... for me <laughs> yes it is yes it is but for me it's just a a long drive and once i get that vaccine and we're allowed in canada <laughs> it's, it's... We'll think about it. We'll think about it. Definitely. What else do we have here? Okay, so we talked about a couple of uh, little dust-ups with your videos recently. Yeah, some, yeah. some good, some bad, some plagiarism, some accusations, <laughs> some apologies, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and just smoothing things over. Now, for me, I have an achievement. I've done it. You've done it. Uh, oh, victory yes. Victory is mine. Victory. Yeah. We'll call it that. <laughs> You know what? I, I'm putting that down in the achievement. If this was a, a video if, game, if that was, would yeah. definitely be on there of like some stupid thing you could do. <laughs> yeah, that... Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You'd have to try for it. <laughs> yes. So the last three videos that I put out, mm -hmm. YouTube made sure to tell me that they were the worst video that I've put out in a while. Yeah. And I did it three times in a row. Three times in a row. That's right. So... YouTube does a little metric, you know, it always gives you the stats on how many people are viewing and everything, but it also ranks your previous 10 videos against each other. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after 24 hours, how many views did each of them get and, you know, all kinds of other metrics, but it ranks them and it tells you like, okay, this video you just put out, it's an average video. It was four of you, you know, ranked four out of your last 10 videos yeah. or it was, it was an amazing video. It was ranked one. Well, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I put out a video, come relax in my tiny tavern. YouTube says 10 out of 10. This is the worst video you put out, uh, according, according to the, like the viewer metrics yes. in, in your last 10 videos. This is definitely the worst, yeah, like not even YouTube's yeah. just like canoes would have been better than this Brent. <laughs> what are you doing? Okay. Canoe was definitely a 10 out of 10. <laughs> yeah. you edit, edit just rode 10 out of 10 until, you know, I put out 11 more videos after that one, you know? Right. Well, <laughs> but yeah, so, so that was 10 out of 10 and YouTube does, you know, it, it gives you the raw numbers and then it says, and then it simplifies it to be like, okay, 10 out of 10, this is the, this is the worst, but then it actually puts words to it. Yeah. So it will actually, you know, so, so under the 10 of 10 <laughs> ranking, it says, Fewer people are clicking on this video than normal. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Thanks a lot. <laughs> and, and it'll and sometimes it'll even break it down. Fewer fewer non subscribers and fewer subscribers are clicking on this video than normal. Yeah. Thanks, YouTube. But the little cherry that I really like yeah. is the picture. What's the uh, they draw I don't know if I've seen this. <laughs> oh, you don't pay attention to your ten out of tens. I don't try get not them to. enough. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm hmm it draws a picture of an airplane and or a paper airplane like and it's right it's okay. like kind of like crashing yeah yeah or or, or like spiraling towards the floor and and it's i love it it's got the the raw numbers it's got the ranking it's got the words telling you the video is really bad and it's yeah. just like this sad paper airplane crashing <laughs> into the floor it's it's, it's not uh, enough for them to just give you the numbers and for you to look at them and go, wow, this is not performing how I, uh, I would have liked or expected. Instead, they have mm -hmm. to just like, they paid someone and, and gave them a briefing and it said, you know, there's a lot of people that need this information and we want you to give it to them in a certain way. We want you to draw something and, and you know, you can come up with it on your own and, and whoever did who got paid $10,000 for this little, little drawing 
it's like, you know what? Sad paper airplanes. That That's what I'm going to go with. It's messed up, you two. if you do well, if you do well, they do have the soaring paper airplane, you know? They oh, do, yeah. That, it's got, they do it's try to make you feel up. better, you know? The, <laughs> Yeah, they tell you one of ten, and they give you the pretty picture of the sailing paper airplane, and they say yeah. more people are clicking on this than normal and mm -hmm. watching for longer and just reinforcement, reinforcement, reinforcement. But Absolutely. Anyway, so the next video I put out, uh, I painted my face on a Yeti figurine. It's brilliant. Uh, one brilliant. out of ten, guarantee. I, I assume. Uh, from, from concept to execution. Absolutely. Brilliant. It was a good paint job, and dude really was thank you thank you it was it was all right i spent uh, a little more time on it than normal because it was such a silly model it was my right. face on a yeti I so mean, good yeah come on it really draws you in <laughs> so i was thinking like okay this is this is a, a silly idea it's a funny thumbnail five of ten you know no problem right 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 down the center son of a gun ten out of ten again <laughs> you know <laughs> My face on a giant Yeti, 10 out of 10. Yeah. Whew. I tell you, that one that one hurt a little. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. The come relax in my tiny tavern, I was kind of thinking like, okay, this you know, doesn't have the appeal of, of some of the other videos we make. That, I, I understood that I could that see one. that, sure. Yeah. The, the, my face on a giant Yeti, man, what a waste. Yeah. What a waste of an awesome model, you know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, still, still fun paint job, still, still fun. But it was good. Man, ten out of ten. That that one kind of hurt. But then I get to thinking, okay, <laughs> wouldn't it be crazy <laughs> if we went for three? You know, a yeah, hat trick, shoot the moon kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Just really lean into it and get the achievement. Have some fun. So you know what? It's time for either a canoe video or a hobby science video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mm hmm oh man and i do have canoe footage i know I, I and do, i'm I waiting on... i'm waiting for it with the fishing where's the fish counter brent i am going to thoroughly enjoy that video and if i need Me too. to like look <laughs> okay so 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 where i'm going with this is i made a hobby science video about resin printing printer resin mm-hmm and yes, indeedy, uh, 10 out of 10, as expected, as planned. But actually, I, I really enjoyed that video and the, and yeah. the comments I got. Like, it's, uh, I'm doing fine. You don't have to worry about my mental health, uh, viewers right. or Casey. <laughs> like, we're, we're, we're doing good here. Well, I did notice that when you, when you did mention it, that, you know, um, it was another 10 out of 10. And I, I was just trying to share with you that one of our awesome subscribers to this channel youtube.com slash paint bravely the podcast left a comment like literally a, a second after you said that in that that discord that we were talking in and i'm like oh he, he hasn't seen this comment and i just wanted to share that with you people were looking forward to your next hobby science video there are people out and there. i am too and no i really appreciate that and <laughs> i'm mostly joking around here uh yeah. Because because if you do start to get sucked into the numbers spiral, you can go to some really dark places. But I'm I'm not in a dark place. I try not to go to dark places too often. Yeah. And if I do, I try to have fun with it. And that for me, that was kind of an excuse to okay, one, let's go, let's go three in a row and see what happens. But also, hey, it's been too long since I've done a hobby science video. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got some stuff I want to say about printer resin and and photopolymerization and all that. It's very enjoyable. Gave me a chance to talk about chemistry for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, not, not ideal for the old algorithm, but I think it's a useful and, and fun little episode. So glad I got that out there. Well, it, and... you know, it, it, after I watched it, it, it got me thinking about shaking my resin. And like, I, I went to go print something today and I was like, oh, got to shake that resin. I got to make sure that stuff is mixed up because, because Dr. Brent told me to. And I did. Hey, you actually and learned I something got, from that. You watched that video. Of course Thank I did. You. <laughs> <laughs> Some of it. Anyways, I got like five straight good prints. So definitely, definitely helpful. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's some superstition involved with that too. Is there really? In terms of getting good prints. <laughs> yeah. Straight up baseball. <laughs> but yeah. If, if good kitty. 
kidding. <laughs> Kitty. Okay. I was just going to say, if whether it's the science of, of shaking the resin or whether it's just like the superstition and the ritual of it, shake that resin. You know what you got to do. I mean, I could see, much like most superstitions in sports, it, it, it puts things at the top of your mind, right? So just by thinking about it, even in a different way, if you're remembering it differently, you're probably not going to make the same mistakes that you would if you were just, you know, laissez-faire going about your day. So, yeah, I mean, I can see how that would actually help you. Do I think it's a superstition that's real? No, not really. I'm not too superstitious myself, but I, I do think that just thinking about it does make a difference. So shaking the bottle, I'm thinking about, okay, you know, these uh, chemicals are mixed properly. Okay, I'm going to pour them in. i got to get all of this stuff done. I'm thinking about leveling the bed, doing all this stuff. So it definitely helped. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah, settle your mind. Make sure, you know, be double-checking everything. Exactly. You know, doing your pre-flight checks while you're doing the shaking, you know, getting getting all that set up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyway that that's that was my most recent video and i'm working on this tank now that's part of a goober town roulette and goober town roulette is normally good for a solid four out of ten especially yeah. if you stack the the last ten with a couple of real stinkers so um, <laughs> right you, know, you got I'm three tens like in a row gotta, like you got a winner next video is a winner for sure <laughs> that is a possibility but you know if it is a 10 out of 10 again that's okay because yeah. then then I have the option of going for five 10 out of 10s in a row. In That's which true. case, it's time for a canoe video with fishing, <laughs> with a fish counter, with uh, MEPS spinning lures versus mm, the mm. Rapala uh, original minnow thing. Yeah. 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 God, I can't wait for that. So, you know, you, you plan for success, but you gotta, you know, if, if not, have those... Uh, back roads to to something funny at least exactly <laughs> i mean that's that's the thing about the way that youtube kind of treats you as a, a content creator it's like they want you to feel a certain way but you gotta like you gotta get out of that can't let them make you feel a certain way about the content that you're creating like you had a good time making that hobby science video so what? Yeah, it I, I did. Matter. I did, and I'm feeling I'm feeling great, or or I was feeling great until uh, actually today while I was sitting painting my tank or weathering my tank, I was watching on Netflix the Social Dilemma, uh -huh. which is <laughs> yeah, it's a documentary about all the terrible things that social media is doing to us and the way it was designed to suck up all our attention and mm -hmm. and if we're not giving it enough attention, it manipulates us to pay attention to the screen again and watch those advertisements and yeah i mean it's it's stuff that we all know about but sometimes just watching it explained to you for 90 minutes is just a real gut punch so yeah it's it's interesting how it takes something like a movie to actually get that message to cut <laughs> it's like we all know about the algorithms we know about certain things that are happening but you sit down and you watch a 90 minute movie with actual people who know what they're talking about and it's like oh man i should just delete facebook my thought my first thought afterwards was uh myspace is primed for a comeback all they have to do is that be was like your first thought yeah that we're not going to do any of this stuff it's just going to be a straight up platform you can pay for the, these things whatever it is what it is i mean there's already some platforms popping up that are like a hundred percent um, yeah, at least they say who actually knows at this point, but are, you know, algorithm free. <laughs> so it, it's an interesting time for social media. Yeah. As, as a creator, my takeaway from that was, okay, maybe I don't worry about the extra views that like some of the clickbaity videos get and maybe just make uh, more useful connection videos and call it a day. So. Yeah, exactly. Like if you're if you're making something meaningful, something that actually you enjoy doing, like who gives a crap if it's ten out of ten? Yeah. Like the people who enjoy those things with you will enjoy them. And that's that's great. Right. That's why we're doing this. 
Right. The comments of uh, this was enjoyable and I learned something for it are way more valuable than the, the little running numbers of how much time you've wasted of, of people. Yeah. <laughs> or time you've consumed, whether it's wasted or not. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, looking at looking at some of those metrics, man, it, it's it's a little ridiculous when you think about it. You know, you stack up however many people, however long they've been watching, you divide that by a year, and it's just, yeah, it's it's kind of nuts. Yeah, I I do that sometimes. So if YouTube will tell you how many minutes people have watched your video, and you can do the calculations to see how many uh, person hours, person days, person years that is. Yeah, and in some cases, it's like, wow, huh? It's an entire this lifetime. Is... <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, uh, my channel. I'm gonna have to be on some pretty serious medications to make my life as long as my channel's <laughs> exactly. lifetime is. You know. Yeah. That's an option, though. The future is bright. It is. It is. <laughs> Maybe we can go to Canada. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> um, speaking of uh, unending compulsions to uh, click and like and thumbs up and down and uh, scroll and refresh, what about the compulsion to buy things for our hobby? Is that mm. is that where we're transitioning into here, Casey? I think so. Yeah. So the the topic of the day that's I mean it's I guess it's kind of loose as of how we're describing it, but what kind of hobby products should you be using? It's kind of the overall general theme of it. And and that's going to go into certain things like items you start with, maybe long-term items, what's good, what's bad. And uh, yeah. you want to start off with compulsion. Let's do that. We could start off with compulsion. Yeah. yeah. So this, this episode is a little bit talking about like gear acquisition syndrome, uh, a little bit about, you know, the buy nice not twice argument uh a little bit talking about the you know psh, you got ripped off you you could have done that with uh, you know craft paints you know, it's yeah. a little bit of that so it's <laughs> uh the the topic today is kind of what quality should you be buying into the hobby at um both in the in the early days of you being part of this hobby but also as you go on and you've been in it for years and years i mean we're pretty much always buying new things to some mm. degree or another maybe maybe you're very disciplined and you're only buying when everything is painted and you need a new model to paint or you actually run out of black paint and you need a new model or you know whatever the case may be yeah but most of us are buying at a uh faster rate than that mm. some would say alarming mm -hmm. <laughs> depending on some who you would are. say alarming <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so part of this talk is, you know, that, that hobbies in general are a place where we spend extra time and, to a degree, you know, extra disposable cash. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but we're kind of talking about maybe where some of those finer lines are for, for each of us here and, and for you guys as well. Mm -hmm. So you were you were telling me, Casey, you want to start with this that you uh, recently made a purchase, like yeah, yeah, we can we can start there and then uh, talk about whether I made good decision. Um, yeah, I I uh, spent a good amount of money, um, buying some camera equipment, uh, some kind of general camera stuff, and then a bunch of paints, and uh, I bought a video monitor. For my camera as well yeah so it's like i'm that I'm so in, to a degree uh, that that sounds like it could be potentially useful um, yeah. i actually know that this episode of paint bravely the podcast is the first episode that you are filming with a brand new camera is that correct that's true i also bought that yeah <laughs> i bought i bought the same camera that you're using um yeah, so that hopefully and... it looks a little bit better it like We've got the same mics. We've got kind of a similar setup. We've got the same cameras now. Like we're trying to to get it up there, you know. It, in yeah, I, don't, I mean, quality. I don't want to go at you too hard here, Casey, but we filmed last episode just fine, and I thought last episode looked pretty good. But this That's time true. we do have the same <laughs> camera, though, so that should make right. things just it's a, be a so little bit better, better. You know, such a better episode. 
especially for everyone listening on podcast mm-hmm. services. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. But, you know, I... Yeah, uh, I, okay. yeah, I'm not trying to embarrass you or anything here, Casey, oh, but that's actually a really good example of, of like, kind of gear acquisition sy- syndrome and, and sort of things that we do a lot. And this is present in absolutely every hobby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it's like I... I've been wanting to get a new camera for quite some time. I've had my eye on a few different cameras and it's like, I, you know, you can make excuses to yourself, right? You can say, well, but it would be so much better for this. You know, in this case, it's, yeah, but Brent's using this camera to record, you know, this podcast. I want to, I want to match that quality. At least it's not necessary, right? Like we were doing just fine. Before. Just so nobody's leaving too many mean comments about Casey here. Uh, when we started this podcast, I did buy a brand new microphone so that I could match Casey's microphone. So That's true. We're, yeah, don't don't blame him all the way. I had a microphone before this. You know, for my actual yeah. YouTube episodes, I used the other microphone. Yeah. But for this, we're all matchy matchy, and mm-hmm, there mm-hmm. you go. Next up will be lights. What kind of lights are you using? <laughs> <laughs> i'll send you the link casey and you perfect. can put that on order perfect yeah. <laughs> yeah um i mean some of the stuff i just recently bought was uh somewhat necessary i'm trying to do some things to make it easier just you know as we do we make purchases to make things easier on us day to day so i got some things so that i could set up a camera above me using the rack that i put on the ceiling which I suppose in itself is another purchase. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, this this is a little bit strange, but maybe a few months ago or so, I actually realized that I pretty much have, like, what I need. Really? And, like, my purchases slowed down a fair bit, which was cool, actually. It's so weird. So it's it's technically possible. So maybe if you just buy faster, you'll reach that point sooner. <laughs> That's a good point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if you mm-hmm. have more money, then you'll spend less. Right. I'm confused. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, no, there was there was definitely a point where I was pretty consistently buying new lights and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Uh, you get a new lens, and then you know, yeah, some paints, and um, but I actually did reach a point where um pretty happy with uh the way the youtube studio is i'm pretty happy with you know what i've got to hand for for actually painting and mm. uh yeah th- there was a point where like yeah okay i'm actually pretty well set up here but i gotta say that's that's quite rare in my life and yeah. in almost any hobby i've had um because you know part of part of a hobby is the uh looking for the next big thing whether that's to improve your enjoyment or or you think you need it or you know just part of being in a hobby is is acquiring yeah. essentially yeah well and especially in in a hobby like uh you know miniatures it, it's in general war gaming um there's always something new coming out right we're always collecting that's that is true yeah so yeah. there's there's definitely some of that going on yeah literally collecting is a big part or is certainly a tangential to to the hobby that we have here yeah parallel whatever parallel yeah (laughs) Uh, so yeah i kind of want to talk about (laughs) where that's healthy and natural versus maybe when it gets a little bit out of control so let's yeah, go through the justifications and rationalizations of of why we consume, and then we can talk about you know at, at, at what level should we be going for the the bare minimum functional and and keeping yeah. the camera that worked just fine before, or or should we be <laughs> you know going for the nice stuff? Or I mean, I think um, it, it as far as like camera stuff goes. Um, I suppose, and I, I guess this could go for pretty much any hobby, but it, it depends on your end goal, right? Like, are you a hobbyist or are you trying to be a professional? Like, are you commission painting or are you painting your models because they're your models and you like to paint them? You know, like if, if somebody 
calls you up and they're like, hey, you know, I need a secret weapon tire black. And, and that's that's the color that's on all of my other models. And you're like, I don't, I don't have tire black. Like, well, well, crap. Yeah. I got to get some. Casey, you are speaking my language. I used a lot of tire black today on that <laughs> tank. Today, tire black was tread black and gun black and other gun black and also a little bit inside the cockpit there. Nice. That's a good color. It actually is. Yeah, yeah it's got a little bit of a blue to it. It's like mm. a blue black. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. I just bought some. I see. I see. <laughs> yeah, so there, there is this um you know <laughs> way of of justifying and not even like air quotes justifying but actually justifying yeah. your purchases by this is something that i you know quote unquote need or will legitimately help me hobby or work better yeah yeah that's kind of what i'm getting at there's there's kind of that two sides to that you know if you have if you know if you've got a black from Citadel and you have a blue, then theoretically you could mix a deep black blue. You don't actually need tire black. That's true. And so, you know, I got to tell you the coverage wasn't great. Yeah. It's not the best. It works. It works a little better through an airbrush. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Coverage is better. Learn. Yeah, the, yeah. Today was my first time really getting into that tire black, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so I've kind of, broken down a couple of ju different justifications here and, and the one we, mm -hmm. we were just talking about is the legitimate belief that better uh, supplies or better tools will make you a better painter right and so uh, access so certainly access to more colors is a possible handy thing to have it's handy um what about where are you on kind of how many different paint lines that you need mm. <laughs> um so so uh, that's actually a really a really common one uh, that i think we fall into is that you know i've uh, the first big purchase i've made since i've been back in the hobby was my set of army painter paints right, yeah and since then i've kind of been branching out and trying other things and mm -hmm. um I did buy, you know, a set of Vallejo air paints and a couple of smaller sets of Vallejo paints and uh, for color matching, a couple games workshop paints. And like that, I think, is a trap that a lot of people fall into of just continually getting more lines of paint because they need more options for blood red or, or whatever. Right. Have. Yeah. I think I think there is definitely that trap that that we fall into, um, especially especially when you're watching YouTube videos because I mean, just me personally, I use, I don't know, four or five different companies in one video, you know? And, mm -hmm. and for the most part, that's whatever is closest to the color that's in my head that is closest to me. And I'm grabbing it. And I, I buy paints because I think, Oh, you know, like this other kind of color that I have doesn't work very well with a paintbrush. Like if I have some army painter color, you know, maybe this other brand will work a little better, you know? And I'm, I'm looking at that from like a time standpoint, like a more I guess professional standpoint. Um, but, but you have a, you have a real belief that, you know, if you could do start dabbling with a new brand of paint that it will make you better. I mean, to, to a or, point. Or, or is it like you think that other brand might be more fun to work with or? I mean, there are certain brands that, that do function a certain way, right? Okay. Um, and, and if I see someone using something like Scale 75, you know, that functions a very specific way and it's not it's not a paint for everyone but it might be your paint you might really enjoy using a paint like that well, you know it's got a gel medium instead of you know the acrylic medium whatever is in there so it's it's a little bit different right then i i feel like that's more of an actual reason to try something like that out 
because it's yeah. made of a different material. Okay, I agree with you there. Sorry, I'm watching behind me. There's two cats trying to get into the same Indomitus box. Get it. Indomitus. Well, they're fighting over the Indomitus box. All right, move your head. <laughs> Matt, Matt, blow that up. No, get back up there. Uh, okay, no, it, sorry. These cats are, are throwing me off balance, but you were actually onto something really <laughs> interesting there, Casey. Okay. So for for any talk about like gear acquisition and syndrome, I I default to thinking about computer games. Okay. And uh, so so for me, like every four years, I build myself a new computer mm -hmm. and I figure out what the you know best processor and graphics card and everything is at the time. And I put together like something that's a, a couple steps below the, the most expensive right, yeah. at that time. And then, you know, so I spend, you know, a fair bit of money on a computer every four years. And then over the course of that four years, it's still like, you know, computers and, and computer games are a hobby of mine and it's something I spend my time and my money on. What am I buying next for this computer? Yeah. And in the scheme of things, I, I the computer works fine. What do I need? Like a, every once in a while, a new computer game, right? Yeah. But it turns out that I need a new keyboard because everybody else is using mechanical switch keyboards and supposedly it's really fun if you have the clacky, you know, uh, cherry yeah. blue MX keys and, <laughs> oh, those are a little bit too loud. Or what about the, you know, cherry brown keys? Or, <laughs> ooh, the, the reds are good. And so... Uh, all of a sudden you have like a couple hundred dollar keyboards. You already had a keyboard. Keyboards don't need to be a hundred dollars. Like your keyboard right. worked fine. Like, the, the one that came with it, the corded one. Right. The, key, <laughs> the, the keyboard that came with your Dell 10 years ago works fine. It's exactly. a USB keyboard. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there, there is this aspect of kind of chasing a, a setup that is more, for you and kind of like what you're mm -hmm. what you were talking with the scale 75 paints there is that they behave a little bit differently and they might be for you you know the, the the feel of the keys are a little bit different and that might make your setup a little bit more enjoyable a little bit more customized and part of that is a real yeah <laughs> Uh, or you're telling yourself that you're going to be better or more efficient or something, but part of it's also telling yourself that you're going to be happier while, while you're working or playing. Yeah. Um, or, or that it's more for you. And yeah, I, I think part of it is just looking for, for a luxury item. Mm -hmm. The, the army painter paints are, are routine and now you need, something a little bit different. And I think this is going to be, be more fun to use a little bit of a premium item. Yeah. Yeah. When you start getting into stuff, um, I, you know, if we're talking paints, like, uh, chimera paints came out and were a huge hit oh, with yeah. a lot of painters because oh, it's, yeah. you know, real pigments. They have all the ingredients on the bottles. You can mix just like you would with professional artists paints. There isn't some other rando color in your bottle. So it, you get that pure color. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's it's such a specific product to it. It is like a luxury kind of thing. And so for me, uh, you know, I, I have been trying to think about all the stuff in, in my hobby area here and whether it's like actually a necessity or something I got because I was experimenting or something I, you know, bought on a, on a whim or, you know, uh, is it a luxury item? Is it a stupid purchase? And for me, actually, the biggest luxury item that I have is uh, like a hundred dollar paint vortexer, right? My yeah. my typhoon, and you know, on, on top of my desk, I have my my cheap brushes and my reasonably priced paints, and under the desk, I have this Cadillac of paint mixers <laughs> that I that I splurged on. It's just a complete luxury item. Yeah, but I'm I'm that's the reason I bought it and I really like having it under my desk and it is one of those things that makes me happy. So yeah, there's, there's a definitely a talk to be had here about what you actually need and what you use every day. And 
you know, kind of optimizing price and performance, but um, there's this all other talk of this is a hobby. This is what you do for enjoyment. This is where you spend your, your fun bucks on. Yeah. And are you, are you getting some, some fun luxury items out of it? So, um, I mean, mostly where I fall down on that is, is if it is, this is what you do for fun and you have expendable cash that is going towards things that you do for fun. I'm like, yes, buy that Vortexer because yeah. it's awesome. Do you need it? You can shake the paint bottle. You don't need it, but it's so good. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's been on my list for a while, like a long while. <laughs> And this is what's so interesting to me too is is that there are other aspects of the hobby where I am, you know, more price conscious or more frugal or whatever. Sure. But sometimes it's just like, no, I, I want the nice thing. <laughs> so, what about what about paintbrushes? Brushes. See, this one's interesting. Um, I used I used Citadel brushes forever, right? Um, you know, when I got into the hobby to begin with, it was like, well, I'm painting Games Workshop models and therefore buying their paints and their brushes because their product is the best. And I cannot mix, you know? And I know we've talked about that going into the hobby shop when we were young and, you know, looking at some other thing, you see, you see Vallejo and you're like, Vallejo. Like, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not Citadel paint. <laughs> You know, oh, how things change <laughs> exactly. Yep. But brushes, like I, I paint almost every day. I mean, it's pretty much every day, and I go through Citadel brushes pretty quick. And at like six, eight bucks a pop, like I go through a couple brushes in a month. That gets pretty expensive. So I switch to a more expensive brush. I bought a. Windsor Newton series seven and that brush lasted four times longer for, you know, twice the price of one Citadel brush. Mm -hmm. So it's a luxury item. It's more expensive, but it saved me money over the long term. So I only buy expensive brushes now. Like I I've justified that yeah. to myself. Yeah. I am i uh, I'm a person who uses cheap brushes. Mm -hmm almost exclusively and i own a couple of nice brushes but for me man i just feel so bad ever getting paint on them because i know that eventually they'll wear out that they should last longer than my cheap brushes but i know that they're a consumable item and that by choosing to put paint on them yeah they're they're just heading towards being all worn out and done and so it's something that i tell myself like no this is this is too nice to actually use. Keep this in the drawer. Pull it out for a special occasion. But sure. The special occasion is literally dotting eyes. <laughs> yeah, and right. Then I put it right back into the drawer. Yeah. I mean, hey, you know what? If if that's the brush that does that thing for you, it makes sense. And you're probably never going to have to buy another one. If you're only dotting mm. eyes with that brush, yeah, that's going to last a really long time. So yeah. it's not it's not like it's a bad investment, especially when you start stretching that over years and years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, old Squidmar sent me a couple of Squidmar brushes, and I've used them to dot eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I have. And I also I have, have a, uh, another Da Vinci <laughs> brush that I've been using to dot eyes, but like my Squidmar brushes are just all right in my drawer, all you know, ready you should, for when I'm ready for see them. Mine <laughs> right now. Like they look so bad. The 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 tips are good, which you know, fine. But the the actual yeah. brushes, like uh, half the logos are all gone. <laughs> like I've I've put them through some serious work. Like I've painted a lot of crap with those brushes. <laughs> See, that's good to know. And you know, you've told me this before, <laughs> but like I still can't bear to take them out because like no, this is. <laughs> This is a nice brush. What I'm, I'm base coating and doing a little bit of detail work. Dude, yeah, straight up, the... like base coat, rinse it out, do some washing with <laughs> it, rinse that out, go for some metallics, like all of the above. It's all yeah. good. So, <laughs> are shopping 
and our spending is meant to make us feel uh, as productive and happy and low stress as possible while we're actually painting. Mm -hmm. And so there, there can be pain, there can be stress while you're working. So there can be the stress of uh, using an inferior product. Sure. Like you can be stressed out by, uh, you know, if you're, if you're working with craft paint mm -hmm. and one, if it actually is a, a harder, you know, material to work with, you know, more difficult mm -hmm. to get the effect you want. But two, if you are telling yourself that this is craft paint, it's harder to work yeah. with, it's not as fun to work with, there is the element of just just not having a good time. And part of that not good time is because you're, you're stressing out over like, I cheaped out on this stuff. This stuff is awful. Mm -hmm. This is not fun to work with. Um, but on the other side of that, if you buy the... I don't know. I, I'm trying. I'm struggling to think of like a truly expensive paint. Like, I guess the answer is like Games Workshop. Like if you buy yeah, the I mean technically six eight dollar pot of GW paint or whatever. We could we could just call it contrast paint. Okay. Yeah. If you buy an eight dollar pot mm -hmm. of contrast paint, uh, there there is stress involved in that as well. Of like there really is. Man, I'm, I am a sucker. Like they. <laughs> They tricked me. They <laughs> they won this round, and especially if you like knock it over and spill it out on your table, that's, that's it a is bad feeling. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh. So so I am more in that camp of being stressed out about working with expensive stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I told you like I got my my Da Vinci and my Squidmar brushes in yeah. the back corner of my drawer. Uh, I've got my cheap brushes on my table. I, I have a couple of contrast paints, but like every time mm -hmm. I go to use them, like I just shake my head about you know what a what a mark I was, what a, what a fool I was <laughs> to, yeah. uh, to pick those up at the store. That's an interesting. I mean, I I totally get where you're coming from with that because I have that kind of feeling about it when I open a bottle. And I'm like, man, this, this stuff is expensive. And especially when I go to lay it down on a base, like I've done all this stuff. I put this rock and made all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm going to use contrast paint to make my bases. And it's like, well, there was a, you know, what is it? A nickel or a dime per base or something like it. Yeah. It, like, it's ooh, that amount. gravel really soaks in that it paint. It does huh? too. <laughs> Yeah, I gotta Ooh, do I a few to different load up coats my brush three times for this base. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, like it, it, it can feel kind of bad. At the same time, I think there's something to be said specifically for ease of use. Mm -hmm. Um, because the and and they're similarly priced. The the Games Workshop, uh, what are they? The the texture paints for bases, right? Expensive. For how much you get yes. and there are alternative brands i'm not saying you know just go out and buy the gw stuff but ease of use factor like i i can open the pot i can get the stuff i can make the base throw the contrast down it's basically done you throw a dry brush over the top of that right like mm -hmm. i can be more productive and i feel better about doing that even if i don't feel so good about the fact that i am spending more money to get that right i mean it's essentially a bottle the size of a gw paint bottle that has sand a little bit of paint and yeah. some glue mixed up together pretty much <laughs> right but i'm sorry i just said that because now you're gonna feel a little bit bad when you run out and you buy it again but well i mean i've like i, w I used them for a long time um because it was like well yeah sure i'll, I'll buy those and you know, do a few things here and there and they work great. You know, like they're not bad products at all. Um, but then, you know, I uh, got a big Tupperware full of beach sand and really haven't looked back. Right. Yeah. yeah an, an alternative is to use Elmer's glue and beach sand. Yeah, that's literally what I do. It, it takes it a little while same. longer to dry. <laughs> um, there's, you know, with that type of base sometimes you get a little bit more flaking off of sand mm -hmm. sometimes uh or, or like chipping off of of a little patch of of sand i've yeah. seen that sometimes but... yeah the 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 pva doesn't quite 
stick to the actual base. So it becomes almost like a sheet that goes over the top that, yeah. that will lift yeah. up over time. Um, right. I found that it helps a little bit if you water down some of your PVA, put it in a separate smaller like dropper bottle and just kind of squeeze a few drops over the base and it kind of just soaks it and it gives a little bit more even coverage. You know, once your rocks are already down and everything, all your sand is, is down. So I don't know. It just helps me. It seems to work better, last longer. Yeah, just throwing that out there. That makes sense. Yeah. Oh, the the actual answer here is the Vallejo texture. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it comes in a much larger jar. Uh, it's quite. It, I don't know. Twenty times. Thirty times. Yeah, <laughs> I think it costs a little bit more than the GW one for a jar, but it the volume is like twenty times exactly. as much. For the exact and whatever same they put thing. in there, it, it does stick to the base a little bit better, and it's got just enough like flex to give it some durability, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's good stuff, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, yeah. but but there is <laughs> always this you know give and take between working with something nice or working with something cheap, and there's different types of stresses and joys that come from both of those. Yeah, you know they're. There is a joy to be like, ha ha, I got this sand at the beach and Elmer's glue. I stole this from a local elementary school and, <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, it's fine. The, the kids have plenty of glue already, you know? They do. And uh, here I, I am making a hundred orc bases with free stuff and look at those suckers over there buying their, their fancy paste. Yeah. And that is a perfectly fine way to get your enjoyment. Like if... Mm -hmm. uh, like I am very proud of of some of the frugal things I've done in my life, and that is a fine way to live your life and a fine way to hobby. And I love this table I'm sitting at right here that I got out of the trash. <laughs> right. and my main painting desk I, you know, bought for twenty bucks at Goodwill ten years ago, and it's all yeah. it's all doing great for me. It doesn't have the same um, problems that my desk has, and this this desk that I'm no. using. Cost more than that. Well, desk. see, right now you're Casey. You're sitting at a flimsy IKEA desk, but behind you, you have a couple of really nice craftsman uh, tool know, right? drawers. Uh, yeah, yeah, tool drawers that are each rated These for like two hundred pounds of wrenches, and you've got like five thousand, paints in each drawer. Thousand yeah, it's great. Just thousand, one one thousand pounds. <laughs> yeah, you have you have some very nice drawers behind you there. It's true. It's it's a and, weird thing, but. But this does bring up something that you brought up earlier. Um, the whole idea of what was it? Buying it buying it nice, buying something nice instead of buying it twice, whatever however you put it. I don't know how you put it. So it's a common phrase, buy nice, not twice. I've actually never heard that phrase, but I try and think about that concept very often. It's an East Coast thing. <laughs> Um, okay. okay. Yeah, like I've I've had this conversation with my wife like so many times of I'm tired of having to to buy crap more than once, right? Like mm -hmm. we've done this thing and, and mostly because, you know, you, you you know, you live in an apartment, you're picking up like you find a couch on the the curb or something. You're like, "Yeah, free couch," right? Like that's just how things were mm -hmm. like when we got married. As we were pretty young, um, but we also both grew up like that's how our parents acted. They're just like, okay, you know, like we found this at a thrift store. Like it's good to go 20 years, you know, and it's like, but the thing's half falling apart, like make it work, <laughs> you know? And, and I'm just so tired of that sometimes that like we have these conversations where like, no, we're just going to, we're just going to buy the nice thing. You know, these, these drawers are a good example. Like, you know, and some people might argue that they're not actually the nice thing. These aren't craftsmen. They're Yukon, but they're still nice. <laughs> um, look, they look real solid. They, I mean, yeah. they are, they're, they're nice, you know, and I, I don't think I'll ever have to buy something like this again. You know, these are the kinds of things that will last. Like I could put this in my garage and it's going to be there until I'm not. You know, mm -hmm. and that's, that's what I'm talking about anyways. Like, I don't like to repurchase things over and over and I still do it because it's like a weird habit, you know, of, of this secondhand market kind of a thing. 
but I, I do think it is worth investing in something that will last. I already forgot what the point was, where we started. No, no, this is this is all <laughs> part of the point here of you know. Or, so, so there's a couple of things. Let's uh, let's talk about recommendations or or gut feelings. Like if your house burned down, God forbid, and you were starting the hobby fresh. Yeah. Would you would you buy expensive? Would you buy cheap? Like what would you? Yeah. What I, I mean, where I'm getting at is, what is your recommendation for somebody who's starting out in the hobby, and maybe they're okay in the first six months of being in this hobby. Like, do you do you have any recommendations on uh, buy buy cheap stuff to see if you even like this hobby, or or buy expensive stuff because you buy nice not twice? Or right. Do you, do you have any recommendations for somebody starting out? If we if we look at it through the lens of like if I were talking to someone new um, and I was going to give them a list of things to buy, then, like, I suppose this would be that. Yeah. Um, for the most part, I would actually say to invest in, I don't know, like longevity more than anything, even if you don't know if you're going to be in the hobby. Uh, partially because if, like, if you do buy something that is fairly expensive, you know, or even mid-range, like you're looking at an airbrush or something, hey, odds are if you're really not into the hobby, you can resell that and get a good amount of money back. If you go and invest in a $20 airbrush, you're not getting your money back. Mm -hmm. At all. So, kind of from that perspective, like, you should probably invest a little bit. Um, I also think that uh, trying to like cheap out on certain materials like paint will just yeah. cause you to have a bad time. Right. Yeah. Like I've seen craft paint work. You can work it. But. Yeah. It's not I mean, this, this question could almost be boiled down to do you recommend brand new painters buy. Oh, uh, 20 craft paints as their first set of paints. Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And of course, you know, we've, we've made, you know, clickbait videos of painting with craft paint yeah. sort of things. Yeah. You can and, do it. You can. I mean, the, the things that work as, you know, clicky titles are interesting because they kind of show you where people get their enjoyment from this hobby. Like some, like some people definitely get it from being frugal. Sure. And so the, the title of, you know, I painted this army using 30 cent apple barrel yeah. you know, craft paints that really appeals to some people. And, yeah. you know, the, the gaming, the system and, and doing something for way cheaper than yeah. how I somebody mean, else does something. I'm all about but, that. Yeah. Like, that's, that's basically what I do. But just not to the craft paint level. Not to the craft paint level, no. Although, <laughs> I should mention, um, while painting miniatures with craft paints is tedious and terrible, and you should never do it, um, through an airbrush with a little bit of medium, some flow improver, you can do pretty well, especially on terrain. Like that will stick. I would agree. To terrain. Yeah. Yeah. Craft paint for minis, not so good. Craft paint for terrain, great. 100%. Cool. Yeah. I've seen yeah. some amazing stuff done with just craft paint and an airbrush on terrain. Yeah. Yeah. So the rest of this question is okay, then over the the long term, you're you've been in the hobby for a couple of years. What level of, of purchases for uh, consumables and, and tools would you recommend maybe over the long, the long haul? I think for the most part where people end up landing is kind of a mid-range. So you're mm -hmm. not going to get a $500 airbrush. You're going to get like a $150, $200 airbrush. And for the most part, that's going to last you for probably a majority of the time that you're in the hobby. Now, obviously, there's maintenance on on tools like that, you know, needles, nozzles, whatever. Um, 
but yeah, I'd say mid range for the most part across the board. Like you're probably going to have a good amount of Citadel paints and Vallejo paints and, and, you know, things that most people use for painting. Um, you're, you're probably not going to have any more Apple barrel that you're using on your miniatures. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, brushes. I still like, even from, even from a starting with perspective, like I think I've come to the conclusion that you should just buy expensive brushes because they're not actually expensive. Or as what was my point, like there's an investment into that and you're going to get more out of it before those brushes go bad, you know? And I mean, Citadel brushes work well enough for a few days, you know? I don't know. Uh, yep. yep. I, I uh, respectfully have a different opinion there. Yeah. And, you know, I, I like dollar brushes for me. That's, yeah. that's my thing. Cause it stresses me out too much otherwise, but no, I totally get it. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's interesting that, you know, on top of my $20 desk, I have my dollar brushes and then I do have, you know, my, my mid range paints, which are like Vallejo is the type of paint I have mostly on my desk. Mm -hmm. And I have a combination of modestly priced minis that I, I scavenged from eBay or, yep. or Craigslist or what have you. Yeah. And Again, there there is joy in the hunt, and that's actually something we talk could talk a little bit about since mm -hmm. this is what you do, right? With eBay miniature <laughs> rescues, is you know part of part of any hobby, part of the the fun of acquiring gear is finding a bargain or finding the efficiency or collecting something yeah. rare or special. It's kind of a hobby within the hobby, right? Like yeah. some people are really into it. I'm into it. I know you like to find awesome stuff, you know, all the time. Like it's cool. It's fun. It gives you that, you know, excitement. That's just another extension of our hobby. Uh, but I know for some people, they're just like, I, I don't care. Like I don't want some busted model that I have to do something to. Like getting it brand new is perfectly fine. You know, especially right. when you're only saving a couple bucks, right? Like, Sometimes yeah. that's the case, but obviously we're not after that. We're after the stuff. Uh, okay. Uh, that unmade, uh, warband that I painted, right? That box is 50 bucks new. Okay. I found it on eBay for $16. Buy it now. Bought it. Done. Yeah. Like, and it is basically complete. I had to do a, a little bit of work. Right, a little bit of uh, conversion kind of aspect to it, but like that's it. It was no big deal, and yeah. it's awesome. Yeah, that's a great example. I mean, there's there's a joy of having a brand new box of unmade that you don't have to do you know, any special. You don't have to salvage. Right. You don't have to uh, repair. Um, but there's also a joy of getting something for a third of the price it was originally marketed at. Yes. You know, and. I think both of those are, are completely valid. And so yeah. on that topic, it is completely personal preference. And yeah. I myself could find myself in either of those camps. Yeah. I mean, some days I'm feeling like whatever. I just want the, I want that model. Depending on how junky they are. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> it does depend. Like, uh, I've definitely passed over some deals cause it's like, that is not worth it. It is not worth the amount of effort that I have to put into that. You know, and that is a metric you do have to look into. Um, you know, your time is valuable and you don't want to be wasting it just fixing something and hoping that it's going to work out. You know, like paying a little bit more for the thing that you don't have to put in a bunch more time on. Probably yeah. you'll, you'll end up having some painted miniatures where, you know, I've, I've had some projects where I started and it was just like, this is not worth doing. And so I never painted it, you know, they're just still on the shelf somewhere. Understood. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There, there is an extra layer of stress for some people of, of seeing mm -hmm. those unmade that are uh, a little bit janky when they show up in the mail for sure. Yeah. All right. Here's a 
question that I promise is related. <laughs> in grade school, did you ever have a trapper keeper? Um, I had the knockoff trapper keeper. Yeah. Okay, how'd you feel about this? This is almost even a better <laughs> answer. Know. Like, let's, let's go into that. <laughs> um, well, like I said, my my parents were a bit frugal, you know. So if it was close enough, and it did the job, it was good enough. So yeah, I had like okay. rando knockoff versions of trapper keepers, and you know they didn't hold up so well. Like I remember having a few that you know were torn on one end, and I had to like tape it up to make sure my papers wouldn't fall out that kind of thing um but yeah i think everybody had some some version of of that when they were in elementary school i think i might have also had an off brand trapper keeper but i I am remembering that i you know i did have a a special pencil case that i really liked and i had a few like you know lucky pencils and i had Mm -hmm, definitely mm -hmm. had some folders i really liked did you have one of those and, little vending machine type deals in your school where it was like, you know, for a quarter, you, you turn the turn the dial, you get a, like an eraser goes on top of your pencil for 50 cents. You got a fancy ass pencil and it was random. I know what you're talking right? about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some, sometimes like the little trolls it might have even had. The, yeah. Yeah. This is all yeah. sorts of random stuff like that, but it was like an eraser dispenser and a and a pencil dispenser and it was always like we didn't have any vending machines in my elementary school but (laughs) but cool cool i mean they they weren't like electronic or something it's just put the you know like the little pizza place vending machines put the quarter you're talking about yeah no we had those at the pizza place right i mean that was a whole other thing too school though getting some sticker from the pizza place to put on your trapper keeper (laughs) yeah yeah. You, uh, you grew up in Reno, though, right? Like, yeah, it's a different had, type of place. Do they have any slot machines in the uh, in your elementary school? Or? <laughs> I mean, hey, right across the street. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Literally. So, so I guess the, the dispenser that puts out a random troll topper for your pencils uh-huh. probably isn't that bad then. No, no. But we it's do have a lot young. of kitty gambling in this town. You know, the good old Chuck E. Cheese and the like. <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese is right next to the actual casinos. I mean, yeah, okay. I, All right. For All right. the most part, our, our fun zones, you know, fun places, whatever, kid, whatever you call them, uh, they are in casinos. And it, it, you can boil it down to just being straight up trading. <laughs> like, that's all it is. Oh, it yeah. It's going to keep me up at night. <laughs> it looks yeah, I'm so going to have to think about that for a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah think about the oh. uh, ethics and morality on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow that's a good one yeah all right i started talking about trapper keepers for a reason here mm. and i'm gonna pull it right back bringing in bringing me back it's all that's what's going yeah, on yeah <laughs> yeah so you know we were talking a little bit about you know enjoying the process of painting and and in that there's almost the giving yourself a little like sweetener for maybe a task that you don't love as much mm. like school uh the actual school work isn't fun but it's but it's a little bit more fun if you have a troll on the top of your pencil mm-hmm. and all your work is in this cool multicolored zipped up trapper keeper with yeah. sweet folders yeah <laughs> and so i i almost think of our hobby a little bit like that of you know for some people it's a little bit more of a chore to to go and sit down at the painting desk mm-hmm. but if they had a sweet vortexer to mix their paint, and every time That's they're true. gonna mix a paint, feeling yeah. pretty good, or 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 I don't know, just whatever like little premium thing that that makes you feel a little bit more engaged with with going to your painting desk mm-hmm. and and putting in some hours. Like, I think there I think there is something there of again one of these rationalizations of why to buy something like. Yeah, I, I think there's a motivational had, uh... aspect about it. You know, when you, yeah, there's the ups and downs, right? Like you're you're going along just fine. You're kind of like, you know, I'd, I'd like kind of a change, something new, something different. You know, so you throw in a curveball and you're like, yeah, yeah, let's try that out and see how that goes. It kind of just keeps mm-hmm. it fresh, right? Like it doesn't get so stale. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. And uh, like I said, my... 
my biggest vice is my sweet, sweet paint mixer. Yeah. And you're just, and of course just I making me want to get one like so expensive. bad. <laughs> I just want one now. Yeah, check out uh, Typhoon Paint Mixers. Uh, it's some, I don't know, some man who runs like a cottage industry of taking old laboratory vortexers and it's he changed. like makes them work oh. again. Like these things are from like the 1980. <laughs> Nice. And he's got like a whole pile of some company put out just this really standard sized vortexer and they made them for like 15 years straight Jeez. and you know, tens of thousands of these units were made. And anyway, this guy's like an electrician or something and he, you know, makes sure that they're not going to burn your house down. He gets like lots really cheap from auctions and stuff. Sure. And, you know, he, he fixes up the electronics to make sure they're not going to build, burn your house down. He puts down like a, I don't know if it's a powder coat or if it's just spray paint, but he, he paints them up and puts a nice sticker on them. And then you got your Typhoon paint mixers. Get them on eBay. That's pretty Typhoon. Awesome. Typhoon. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah. there's a little motivation right there. You know, it's just uh, some guy running a cottage industry, you know, there's, I don't yeah, put out any like, really local offensive business. commercials or anything. Like that's a that's a guy I'm willing to support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it. <laughs> and of course, actually, in, in terms of the the continued spending, like uh, support your local game store. You know, yeah. If you if you're not quite sure what you want to buy next, go to, you know put your mask on, go to your local game store, and uh, buy something. There you go. Uh, I. I saw something kind of interesting the other day. Um, mm. My local game store, I should say the store I'm now calling my local game store because it's so far been better than any other local game store I have. Your store. Right. Yeah. Um, they have a section in their games workshop stand that is like beaten and broken. So any boxes that were shipped that got messed up, they're giving a discount to. I just thought that was kind of awesome. I've never seen that from any other hobby yeah, shop. I haven't seen that before either. Yeah. What kind of discount are we talking about? I don't know. It was, I saw it online, uh, you know, cause I follow them on, on Facebook or whatever. Um, uh, and I, I didn't get a chance to make it down. They, they kind of it, it made it sound like, Hey, these are probably going to be gone. Like in the next few hours. Um, but some of it okay, was like so Indominus like stuff. One crate that got messed up. Ooh. Yeah. So I, I got to go check it out tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I just thought that was interesting. I don't know. But you, I'm, my point is you never know what you're going to find at your, your local hobby shop, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I go in and see new things every time I go in. It's, it's amazing. I love going to a hobby shop. So Yeah, part of the hobby is just straight up shopping, whether you have a really good reason for you know, a plan for acquiring something or not? Well, I live, I live far enough away from a hobby shop that if I go, even if I don't find something that's like really compelling, like I'm going to buy something. Like if it's a pot of paint oh, yeah. or something, like I got to buy something. I drove there. It took me 45 friggin' minutes. <laughs> like I'm mm-hmm. coming home with something. <laughs> it, it just occurred to me. I have one more recommendation for little luxury items to, to spice up your life at awesome. your hobby table. Awesome. Lay it on. I'm me. currently sitting in a, a quite nice chair. This is from Staples. It's the mm. Hyken. Hyken. Uh, H-Y-K-E-N. And um, don't don't pay like more than 160 or so for this chair. Right. Like they, they mess around with the prices. But You can actually negotiate yeah. at Staples, Office Depot, Office Max on chairs and printers. It's just like a car. They're not actually set. This is this is useful information Absolutely. to me. You can totally yeah, Normally, I just have to find it on like a different website and say, like, are you price match <laughs> yeah, for your much. own website in the store? <laughs> like, <laughs> I used to work at Office Max like, like 15 years ago. Uh, and yeah, uh-huh. like prices were negotiable. I don't, I don't actually know if they still are. I think they are like for the chairs and office furniture and stuff, but like they definitely were when I worked there. Look, well, you, know. you tell them paint bravely sent you. Absolutely. And that you, <laughs> you give and them that my number. Brent, in case you told you that you could get a Staples hiking chair for $150 and that <laughs> it was worth it, but that was your, all you were going to pay. 
I bet you and if you did that, if you said, hey, I, I heard this thing on a podcast, like 150 bucks, chairs like MSRP 165, they'd probably be like, yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone was asking me about this chair the other day, and I looked it up, and it was like $240. I'm like, no, don't do that. No, I look, yeah, don't do that. look uh, I'm telling you, I like this chair. I don't like it for $240. No. Although You get two maybe, and a half vortexes maybe. for that. You, you don't want to. You don't want to mess with that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But this thing's got lumbar support. It's got it's got mesh bottom. It's got a mesh back. Mm. If you want, it has an attachable mesh headrest. I don't I don't want at the moment. But the other thing is, this mesh, I have no idea how it does it, but it is resistant to cat claws. Really? You know, several times a day I hear like one of these cats like scratching <laughs> on the mesh. And ordinarily, you'd think that would like the cat would fall through the chair like yeah. in, in a few seconds later or something. But 100%. no, it hasn't happened yet. It's incredible. All right. Hmm. I. Uh... But uh, you know, think of think of little little luxury items. It's it's okay to to buy something nice for yourself, but think about what'll make you happy for there. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's. Man, I'm 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 going in a little bit into the like buy yourself something nice, but part of this is like you said that to people last also week. A lot of people were saying Brent syndrome. told me I could buy a Titan. Brent told me I could buy uh Indominus. Yeah, Brent to told clarify, me I could buy uh, yeah. in episode fifteen. Uh huh. I said that if you needed a little bit of hobby motivation, you had my permission to go to your local butt game store and I believe said buy yourself one small unit i think i said small did i not say small well, so you started up by saying buy yourself something nice right something like that i i could be wrong yeah and but then, then, I, then you, I realized the yes, uh, the terrible the pitfalls i may have been yeah yeah i'm just saying people uh they must have stopped listening at that particular moment in time people hear what they want to hear that's yeah. true they will buy what they want to buy look you go to your hobby store, you buy yourself something nice, you go to your staples, and well, I'm serious about this one, but sit in all their different chairs. Oh, yeah. Find one you yeah. like, uh, search the internet to find out what the price of that chair actually should be, <laughs> Yes. and then start an argument with whoever you need to yeah. to make sure that you leave that that place with your chair at, at your, your price. price. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I've been rocking a... At the time, it was like a hundred bucks. It, in fact, I might have actually worked there when we got. I don't know. It's like this old leather chair that I've had for a long time. It's real comfy. That uh, you stole from Office Depot uh, fifteen no. years ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just uh, you know, late night working, just threw it in the back of my truck. No, <laughs> like mm -hmm. I can't remember why I got it, but I got it. <laughs> Uh, and I also use one of those like the doors uh, slide open and Casey just slides all the way over to his truck. Yeah. <laughs> just out the loading just bay. Rolls across the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I honestly don't even remember where he got it, but it's a super comfy chair and it actually it, it does actually make me want to come and sit down at my hobby desk. Like I like sitting in that chair. I have for a long time, so I totally get where you're coming from with this. I wouldn't recommend getting one of those yoga ball chairs, though. It's a bad idea. The what chairs? The yoga ball chairs. You know what I'm talking about? It's like a little black yeah, plastic sorta. thing, and there's like a yoga ball sat in the center of it. And it's like a chair with a back to it. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've known people that, like, for their, for their office work will sit on a yoga yeah. ball chair. I mean, that's what it's for. Yeah, just, but, just uh, staying a little bit mobile and getting that balance. and It's fun for maybe a day. Yeah, I go through phases of, of standing desks. Okay, where, sure. Oh, yeah, and then it's good for a couple hours, and then I just convert it right back. Yeah. <laughs> you push that button back down, you sit back in your nice comfy, oh, comfy no, chair. Oh, right. Well, this is, this is a story for another time. I've never bought the ones with a button, but... I've uh, bought linear actuators and wires and batteries and stuff okay, before, sure. so that's a that's a whole different story. <laughs> well, that's the IKEA hack, right? Like you buy a, a they have a set of legs that mm -hmm. are for those desks, and it's it's like super inexpensive, I guess, and you just attach your own top to it. There you go, standing desk. Boom. 
Yeah. Boom. So did we reach any conclusions here today, Casey? I I don't know. I think we're kind of Did we set out to uh to reach any conclusions? I suppose not necessarily. And and the reason for that is that everyone is different, right? We all have you know, different incomes, different levels of of I don't want to say necessarily dedication to the hobby, but like how much we're in it, right? Um so it it just depends. Like if you find that you can go buy a pack of 20 brushes from Hobby Lobby and they work for you, then of course, like, do that. Like, you don't need to go buy some Windsor and Newton brush to, like, feel good about the hobby. Like, from a personal standpoint, I actually save money doing that. Right? Other people might not. And that's really mm-hmm. what it comes down to, is like, if it works for you, then great. Whatever gets you to sit down at your hobby desk and paint some minis. Yeah. If the if the thrill of saving money makes you makes you happy and stress free and ready to sit down and paint monies, that's cool. But if having a twenty dollar paintbrush makes you really get in, you know, having that premium item really drags you in, cool. Yeah. Um and and like I said, I've got my premium paint mixture, my my cheap but good desk, my cheap brushes, and my medium priced paints. And for me, that's all perfect. But for someone else, you might have a a different assortment there, and that's cool too. Exactly. Yeah. If you've been listening to this episode, like my cats have been all over yeah, this episode, are. and Casey's done a really good job of covering when like a cat's <laughs> nuzzling the microphone or chucking cats behind me or. Um, you know, we should just roll the cameras. We got to have footage, like just a couple of hours straight of cats in a room. If ever our video feed doesn't work, we're just going to do that. Yeah. If, uh, (laughs) if this video podcast ever opens with me paddling a canoe, you know that we screwed up the footage (laughs) and we had to do what we had to do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That seems fine. All right, Casey, what else are we doing today? Did we did we did we do it? Did we crank through? I think we did. I want to say we did. I feel like we did. And Feeling I can't good? think of anything else that I actually want to talk about. Uh a, a viewer uh PP uh asked uh-huh, us uh-huh. Uh, or asked me what type of port wine mm-hmm. I enjoy, tawny, ruby, or white. And I got to say actually the the last time we recorded, the next day I went out and brought bought port wine, and normally I drink ruby. So mm-hmm. yeah, I bought some some regular port wine, but they also had tawny there. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'll give this a try. And there you go. white port wine. I don't know if that's a thing. I've never tried that. Is that is that a thing? I don't know. I don't know. Seems like so. Actually, I backwards. Uh, Tawny, either I've never had before, or I hadn't tried in a long time, but I actually like that tawny port wine. Okay. Think about it. Again, just a just one of those nice little luxuries for sitting down at your painting desk and yeah, yeah. getting things just the way you want, you know? We got a lot of good drinking Sit down suggestions. Down that comfy for, chair, for get that too. tawny port wine. Mm. Those cats out of the room, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need more Indominus boxes. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, thank you again for joining us on another episode of Paint Bravely. If you enjoyed this podcast, please help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, subscribing to the YouTube channel, and sharing this message with your hobby friends. As always, we appreciate each and every one of you for listening, and we will talk to you next time. We appreciate you, and we'll talk to you next time. Is there anything else? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not motioning towards you, Casey. I'm trying to get this, lure this cat into a place where I can grab it and chuck it off the table. Yeah. <laughs> Just throwing that Indominus box behind you. There's already a cat. There's oh, already I know. a cat in the Indominus box. I know there is. They don't. They both don't quite fit. Mm. <laughs> They're pretty fat. I don't know. <laughs> that's how they get. <laughs> yeah, that's how they get. <laughs>